So for me, it's uh, we're trying to understand this, you know, going back to traveling. I've done it, uh, one or two trips now, one for, to Denmark and one to France, right fairly recently, oh, in 2022, I should say. And I just feel that that feeling of, of uh, being on, on, you know, on an airport. Now it's something, you know, we can be going anywhere and, you know, you're, you're in this sort of transition bubble. You're not, you're, you know, you're some, you can be who, whoever you want, that kind of feeling that goes with traveling. But of course, if you do it very a lot, like you said, you get numb to that feeling, I think. And so that high goes away and then it's yeah. more the fatigue that is left, yes. I guess. I yeah. agree. Yeah. Well, I guess it's still, I still, you know, try, th I, I think, you know, traveling is, is just um, a lot of nuisance and, and no, I, I prefer I, the comfort of my home. Uh, and and I love traveling as well. And and for me, you, you, you know, going back up traveling, and it's a big thing. But I, but I realize also that it is nice and comfortable in your home and all that. So it's also, you can get for two, I mean, it's that sort of, you get too much of it. So, so the whole value the whole experience is numb, has been numbed down. So, but how was it now for you when, I guess now when you went to Abu Dhabi was like the first time in how long time you, you did a proper, like you go going on a flight for you? Yeah. I mean, we, I did, go to Italy yeah, exactly. <laughs> during uh, New Year's. So that was like the first travel oh, okay. um, in, since COVID started. In two years at least, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I don't know, like that was more like I went to friends. Uh, they picked us up at the airport and everything. So this was the first mm. real travel. With, this, with small adventure where you're in the new place, how does it work here and all this? Exactly. And yeah. I, it was I, just vacation or what was the purpose of the no, trip? It was vacation. Mm. So it was super nice. I really like, I think the Middle East is uh, nice in so many ways. What was your sort of key highlights of, uh, was it, were you staying in Dubai as well as Abu Dhabi? Yes. Where, where were, were your highlights on this trip? Um, I have to say that I was very impressed of the, um, mosque yeah, the mosque. That was amazing. Um, I've been to the mosque. Because the beauty of the actual buildings or what was the impressive thing? Exactly. Uh, I think it was very, uh, to me, it was very similar to, uh, Taj Mahal mm -hmm. in India. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's supposed to be one of the world's most beautiful yeah. buildings. So I really think it was super beautiful. And that was in Dubai or Abu Dhabi? Or Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. Mm. Nice. And, and what was the weather like in, in Abu Dhabi? Was it like Swedish summer? I would oh, say. Okay. Okay. Twenty so, so plus degrees or something. Uh, uh, without the rain, yeah. <laughs> minus the rain. <laughs> so basically, uh, not the Swedish. Go, going going <laughs> in, in Swedish winter time to Abu Dhabi is probably the most perfect time in some way. I mean, I get I guess kind of hot if you go Swedish summer time. Exactly. Uh, because I've also worked in the Middle East uh, mm. for a project and um, it was very warm <laughs> when it started uh, coming close to summer. Yeah. So I think it's totally uh, a good time to go at this yeah. time of I year. I think a lot of people have like the frustration that they you know want to travel now and probably the airlines need also some a you know, way to survive the, the last, last couple of years. So nice to see that uh, people we, are starting to travel. Uh, on a, did you recognize if you think the airline prices had gone up or about the same? Did you have any view on that? Were you thinking about that? Yes, I was. And I think that um, when I looked at tickets uh, in general, I think it seems like they've gone up. Everybody has been sort of uh, uh, see, expecting that or mm -hmm. thinking or, um, yeah proclaiming that and maybe, maybe not. I don't know. A little bit, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some occasion sounds like an awesome idea. Any uh, other plans for traveling uh, soon? No. So this, this was what I was looking forward to mm -hmm. and now it's gone. Uh, <laughs> but you can probably live on it for a while. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, with that in a very welcome here, Therese Svensson, um, data scientist and AI, I guess, AI ethics specialist. Is that the right? Uh, title or yeah, solution specialist. Solution yes. specialist at IBM. Thank you. Lots of interesting topics here to cover, but let's start with your background uh, a bit. How would you describe yourself? Who is Therese Svensson? 
So professionally or <laughs> privately? Start privately <laughs> if you want. Uh, yeah. uh, well, I, I did grow up in the north of Sweden. Mm. Um, and north like which part? Yeah, Sweden? I grew up in uh, Åre, or oh, actually yeah, Duved, close to oh. Åre. Mm. So I moved away from there after high school. Mm. And then I um, I moved to Stockholm. Started At work what age? Uh, what, approximately? 19. 19. And started working a little bit to earn some money. And then I went out to traveling. So you I went traveling as yeah. well. You did the backpacking route at that point in time? <laughs> I did go to Australia to do some Ooh. backpacking. Yeah. Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I lived there and we had a lot of backpacking friends coming through when I lived there. Oh, that's nice. Where did you live? I, um, first I did my university out there in the 90s. Then I was stayed in Wollongong, it's south of Sydney. And then I've lived there uh, in the mid 2000s. And then I lived in Manly and, and the beach up from Manly, which is fresh water. Ah, oh, this is Sydney. so nice. I yeah. loved Australia. Yeah. What's the nice thing with Australia? What, what do you think the nicest things are with that country or the people or something? Well, I think for me, it was also that it was the first trip that I did on my own, like a long trip for a long time that I did on my own. Uh, and the freedom, uh, like find, meeting all these new people and obviously the temperature, <laughs> because I really like uh, not having to be cold. <laughs> um, so, and everyone's so friendly, both like all the backpackers, but also the, the people in Australia. So I think the atmosphere. But isn't it something very unique with this sort of that type of backpacking traveling? Like when you have a longer period that you're traveling, you, there, there's a greater degree of sense of freedom, in my opinion, because a little bit like we go here, we have now touched down on, on literally another continent. What are we going to do now? Well, what do we want to do? And are we going to stay here for one more week because we love, we got some new friends and we're going to hang out with them and we're going to go for this. And now, now we go to the next place. I mean, like it's something special with that type of traveling. Am I summarizing it fairly? Yes, totally. And I think that uh, goes back to something that you said earlier also, because uh, for me, when, when I was traveling a lot uh, in like the end before COVID, uh, when I was t being a, becoming a bit tired, um, I also felt that, like you said, that the, um, the feeling of traveling was uh, going away but also the fact that I couldn't prepare for it. So I, I didn't have, the travels came so close, so I didn't have time to plan for it. And when you have like shorter trips, you want to make sure if you're just there for a week or a weekend, then you need to make sure that you visit all the <laughs> stuff you want. But when you go backpacking, then you don't need to have plans because you will have so much time. It's, and the plans is unfolding because in a way the plan is to get there. And then let's see what the next plan will be. And opportunistically, the plans unfold, which is an amazing. The plan is to have no plans, is that what you're saying? No, <laughs> you have a plan, I, I agree, but you have a plan on a macro level. <laughs> meta, meta plan. Meta plan. Meta. Instead, <laughs> instead of having a plan on, I'm gonna visit this mosque in 225 in order to have time to go to Disneyland in 226. I'm sort of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch down in Sydney and soak in Sydney for a week to really understand what my next step will be. That's a plan, but it's a meta plan. Yep. <laughs> so. It's nice. Do you, do you agree? Yes, I do, I do. And you stay there for a year or a long time? Uh, no, just a few months. A few months. That's and so then I actually went to Italy to mm. study Italian. Mm. Ah, to st study the language specifically. Exactly. Mm. Was that the first experience and encounter with like studying Italian or had you done it in school before? No, it was the first. I, I didn't know a word of Italian when I came there. How come so you, how? you went there then? Yeah, it was kind of a cultural shock, I have to say. <laughs> but what was, what, was the incent what was your motivation, so to speak? It was that I was, um, I wanted to travel mm -hmm. and I was traveling on my own. And then I thought a few months in Australia is fine, mm -hmm. but I don't want to go to Australia alone for a year, okay. but I wanted to travel for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I go somewhere to study, 
then I will meet people and kind of right. build my own new life. And then studying a language was all was <laughs> the easy thing to do. So it's, it, it has some. The way I I did it was I was after uh, um, gymnasium, I guess, secondary upper school. I wanted to travel. I had no money, and then someone explained. You can seek CSN loan to study, <laughs> and then of course I wanted to go to Australia to go backpacking and travel. But I I enrolled in a university, and then from that, that as a base we did traveling like that. So I I did my three years in Australia studying, and a bit of backpacking. Ah, oh, okay. so that's how I solved it. But it was uh, but I understand now uh, the connection is like okay I want to travel, but at the same time I want to find a base. I want to find a new life. Or you know I think it's good. Exactly. Totally understand what that <laughs> came about. You know, I was thinking that like that. So you stayed in Italy for some time, then half a year, or what? Yeah, was it? half a year. Hmm? And, and do you, you become? Went, sorry, went back to Sweden then after that, or what happened after that? Um, I did go to Norway actually. Norway. I went to Oslo, and uh, I became one of these uh, <laughs> Swedes <laughs> who work yeah. in Oslo. Hmm? But I didn't stay for long because I just wanted to go back to Italy. Because I had fallen in love in Italy, oh really? Um, so I just needed with the to country or some person. Actually, the, the country, but also a person. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I went back uh, as an au pair right. ah. uh, to another. Like I studied in Florence, but I um, went back as an au pair outside of Rome. Nice. And was it a big difference between the different parts of Italy? I, I know people that have friends in Milan, and the, it's quite clearly a difference between northern Italy and how was it Florence to Rome? Um, yes, uh, yes, it's a difference, and also the way that they speak mm -hmm. is differently. So, uh, uh, yeah, and also the behavior, uh, the food, everything is a bit different since it's such a new country. Oh. N new in what way do you mean? Um, Italy as a country was founded in like 1860s. So compared to many other European countries, it's actually quite I don't know my uh, European history here. Uh, you know, where's Rome? Rome? <laughs> because Rome is the, 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 yeah, exactly. That's the, what the, I'm the, the, well. the Italy, it, Italy, the modern Italy is founded in the 1860s. Exactly. But what's, what, what was before then? I don't know my history, yeah. I realize. I'm also sorry. <laughs> every road leads to Rome, you know, that's what I'm thinking about since the Greeks or something. So. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's old Italy. Yeah. Uh, before that, it was just uh, um, parts. Uh, Italy was divided into small parts with, I think, kingdoms, or I don't know what you would call them, but it's, the regions were actually... More less, autonomous. Mm -hmm. So it's the United States of Italy in some way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, something. Cool. Awesome. But then you went in some way or form back to Sweden at some point, or? Exactly. So then I needed to go back to Sweden to study. So I started university in Sweden, uh, engineering in Uppsala. Yes, mm. Uppsala University. What, what do you think about Uppsala University as a as university? I think it's a great university, but then again, I, I don't have that much to <laughs> compare it to since yeah. it was there I went. I heard a lot about it there. Uh, first of May kind of celebrations there. That's one of the kind in Sweden, I think. Uh, yeah, that was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Could you, for someone who doesn't know Uppsala University, what, what is happening on first of May? Uh, well, actually, it's the day before yeah, first exactly. of May. Uh, Valborg. <laughs> Valborg, yes. Um, so it starts with um, champagne breakfast. Of course. And the problematic part is that you've, probably been, this is probably the third day that you're partying. So <laughs> it's not like the champagne or it's, since you're a student, it's more likely to be Cava or Prosecco, but it's not like it's uh, going down very easily. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you start there and then you just go on to have, um, uh, going to a park, picnic in a park, um, outside of the university buildings. Uh, and then you go on to um, have a uh, herring's lunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's drumming, or no? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and obviously you need to continue then to, um, yeah, how to uh, say this in English, but the champagne galop. 
Yeah, the, I, I the, don't the, know what that is. <laughs> yeah, the champagne uh, galop. Race. <laughs> race, the champagne race. Exactly. So that is when you go to the Uppsala Nations um, and you um, buy a bottle of, once again, not champagne, probably mm. Cava or Prosecco, and then you just spray it all over <laughs> and wow. you uh, you drink some of it or you buy two bottles and you drink one and you spray the other one. And yeah, after... Right. Exactly. <laughs> and after that, I mean, people continue, but after that, I'm always done with drinking alcohol. So after that, I'm always, I've always been drinking water. But, and, and this is, of course, uh, Uppsala is uh, uh, one of the older, greater universities in Sweden. And this tradition is, I guess, m- quite old and is literally the whole university, or if not the whole town participating. Yes. So yes. it's, it's a festive uh, situation. Yes. And uh, students from other parts of Sweden. Yeah, joins in. Also joins, yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, I heard other students coming up to uh, Uppsala just because of their... Valborg celebrations. But still, uh, you went there to study. What did you study that, at that time? Uh, social technical uh, systems engineering. Social technical systems engineering. Yes. Exactly. Can you explain or elaborate more on that? Yes. Um, so it's uh, more or less it's about um, studying both the technical part of Yeah, technical solutions, but also to keep in mind, like the more human part mm. um, of solutions um, or technical solutions. So when we we were studying complex systems, for example, and um, always focusing on both what could go wrong, for example, from a technical point of view, but also from um, The human, interaction. human interaction. Yeah, I guess uh, it's similar to AI. I mean, we really want to use AI together with humans, right? Human in a loop kind of situation, right? Exactly. But the, uh, yeah, so of course that field of studies uh, is it getting more relevant or less relevant as the technology evolves? Um, I would say that it is very relevant. I would say so too. Yeah. So. Awesome. Um, in, yeah, what we were studying was a lot of obviously math since it's engineering, but also statistics, um, modeling. Um, yeah. And, and how, how do you pick up on these social or human dimensions, the softer dimensions in an engineering? What type of classes do you do then? Yeah, that's a good question. So we had like, um, human centered system design. For example, mm. uh, we also uh, studied uh, studied uh, philosophy. Mm. Um, we studied studied also uh, economics, mm. so organization, for example, uh, to understand that part, uh, which is very relevant <laughs> to companies. Obviously, is, is it fair to say that when you have this angle? One dimension, what you're actually thinking and studying is the contextualization of systems in how they are worked and use and of value. And, and, and would that be a fair un- yeah. understanding? Yeah, that's a really good um, summary of what it is. Mm. Sounds very relevant. <laughs> awesome. And um, what happened after the school or after the, after university studies? What was the next step you took in your career? Yes. So I did um, really appreciate the um, machine learning or data, data you mining. You took some machine learning yeah. classes then as well? D- data mm-hmm. mining. Data mining, yes. And that was super interesting. So I wanted to continue with that. So I was looking for um, thesis uh, work um, or yeah, to write my thesis uh, in a company where I could um, do this. Yeah. Uh, area and I did find a thesis uh, at Scania mm-hmm. where we did some um, um, yeah work that was not really as much data mining as we initially hoped for it mm-hmm. was more uh, databases and mm-hmm. uh, stuff like that but it was very close 
And while we were doing this thesis, I did it together with a um, school um, friend, mm -hmm. and he was very interested in IBM. Mm -hmm. And he was going to IBM for one of these student meetups. So right. I just came along. Mm -hmm. And um, then, um, yeah, it was time to start uh, looking for jobs. And when we had been at IBM, they had talked a lot about this field. So they talked a lot the field about field of social technical uh, data mining, data mining, data, mining, data, mining, data science. science. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. So that was uh, the reason why I was looking at uh, IBM and applying for their uh, graduate program. Because you felt okay. you felt they were sort of framing the topics that they were talking about was close to the interesting topics that you had sort of fallen in love with. Exactly. And that they were focusing a lot mm. uh, in, within this area. And yeah, that that was a focus area also for them. Yeah. What was their graduate program? Can you just describe what that was? Yeah. So it was, um, in my case, uh, the graduate program that I applied for and that I eventually also got mm. was uh, within the uh, software sales organization. Mm. So it was as a technical specialist right. within uh, IBM's software group, uh, mm. as it was called at the time. And a specific uh, software that you focused on at that time? Well, I did say at the interview already that I was uh, applying because I wanted to work with data mining. Yeah. So <laughs> I I got to work with IBM's uh, data mining tool at the time, which was the called SPSS. SPSS Modeler. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And what, what's the, um, how do we frame data mining in relation to data science or uh, do we have a simple uh, explanation or definition to understand data mining in yeah. this context? Very good question. Um, a data mining, I would say, is kind of a, um, a part of what is now um, described as data science. Mm. So it's more narrow than data science. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's actually a set of uh, different types of algorithms used to um, do mostly do predictions, mm -hmm. um, but also, yeah, to structure data. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the word data mining comes from that you're trying to mine for information uh, within a, data, a large data set. So not mining Bitcoin, Bitcoins, <laughs> but actually mining no, but, some kind of useful information. But, but it's really data, interesting right? because uh, if we follow the trajectory of, of, of the industry, uh, we have had different core ideas on, and, and even vocabulary to some degree. So when, when you say data mining, I, I can almost place it in a year yeah. <laughs> when, when we were talking about data mining. So, so what, so if, so data mining is a set of data science with a set of algorithms for certain types of use. Yes. What is the typical data science problem? Uh, so like what, if the question is what, um, uh, what data science is that data mining is not, I would say that data science also includes like a, a prescriptive analysis. Mm. So that is optimization. So not only uh, predicting the future, but also uh, when you have a prediction, optimizing on what a system should do mm. next based on the prediction. And, but uh, so but I, I was going in a little bit different direction because data mining has typically, in my understanding, and you are the, I don't know it as deep, but it has, it, it is a certain type of algorithms we're using more or less for a certain specific data problem. Like that was, that's what's in a way the cutting edge. Um, what, what, what was that time series data? Was it sort of a regression type problems or what was the type of data mining prediction yeah. problems? Yeah. Structure data. Structure data. Ah. Yeah. And also, um, I, now it starts getting tricky, but I would say that what is now um, known as deep learning mm -hmm. might not be a part of data mining, but this is also where you, if uh, if we start Googling, we would probably find... Uh, these terms find, and definitions, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we would probably find different definitions, but 
from my perspective, I would say that data mining would uh, probably not include deep learning. So not okay. the most advanced um, algorithms, which are usually used for but, unstructured data. But, but, but maybe as a very simple way to uh, g go into another angle to understand what does IBM mean with the data mining is also to look at the tool set. So the data mining tool number one for many, many years has been SPSS. And then, then you can have a look at what can you do with SPSS? What problems do you, can you help get help from SPSS? So I guess this is a backwards way to understand. Yeah. And also, yeah. I mean, it's a term, you know, that has some history and people switch yeah. other terms, but they still mean the similar things. So yeah. it's more also about like the current fashion, I guess, in terminology. But in this way. is true, right? Because we, we, we need to put data mining and then, okay, are we now defining data mining in the 2015 context or do we define data mining in the context of 2022? Yeah, that's a relevant question because like you said, from my BM's perspective, it was, we were talking about data mining for a while, but now we're not. Yeah. So. <laughs> But also SPSS, the, the, there's so many different products there as well. And um, the modeler was one, right? But you have, what was it, Statistica or Statistics? And then yes. what was the, the family of products that they had in SPSS? Exactly. Statistics uh, is used for more the yeah statistical. Mm. Regression. Uh, yeah, exactly. Prediction. And when you're trying um, to, um, when you're testing a hi hypothesis, mm. so the classical statistical um, tests, yeah. While data mining is more when you have larger data sets mm. and you you might not know what you're looking for. So you're not trying to uh, prove something in particular. You're just trying to understand something. Mine uh, for insights. And that's, that is also an, an interesting dimension here that you, sometimes you, we were, and this was also at the time, in different times, we're exploring our data. We're trying to find new patterns, right? Maybe this is more data mining to some degree than I have a hypothesis. I want to validate this problem. Yeah. And if, if I want to do the more exploratory topics in, in using SPSS, which, which of the products is more for this? Uh, the more exploratory. Yeah, if you want to do the mining part, is it more in the statistic or the modeler? Yeah, that's the modeler. That's the modeler, right. But now now in, <laughs> in 2022, we have other products. <laughs> yes. I still remember a day of Spotify times where a number of IBM sales people were sitting there trying to sell us modeler and statistics and Watson analytics and a number of things. And I asked them a simple question about, you know, can you please describe to me when should I use Watson and when should I use SPSS? And it said, they're both useful. They're both good, but for different things. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, you have such a deep portfolio, of course, in IBM. Yes. Um, so but, but if we just try to, how, how would you describe like Watson Analytics versus SPSS modeler potentially? Do you uh, have any? Well, Watson Analytics, I could totally do that. I just have to say that that's a, product that doesn't really exist yeah. for, right. per se anymore, yeah. but it's part of another product, which mm. is called Cognos, mm. uh, Cognos Analytics. So it has kind of uh, emerged into that. But uh, what Watson Analyti Analytics was used for was for um, more, not really um, data scientists or analysts, like that type of analysts, mm. but it was more used by uh, BI, BI people, like business intelligence people who are looking at um, historical data. So while um, Modeler is used to kind of predict the future, Watson Analytics was more to uh, display historical data. I, mean, I still remember how rather impressive, you know, demos of Watson Analytics where you can more or less, you know, input the raw data that actually then suggests, you know, what type of models to have versus modeler, you have to know a bit more potentially of this is what I want to do. And here's the data. And it seems to me, and, and I probably uh, am wrong, but in Watson, you can do the opposite, basically provide the data and it suggests, you know, what models to use in some way. And also, of course, text was a big part there, right? Yeah, I mean, in Watson an Analytics, just like you said, you could uh, get suggestions on what it might be that you're looking for and what you're interesting interested in finding. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. so many different products at <laughs> IBM. But uh, they, this was the cool. first part, right? The graduate program. And, 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 exactly. And, and when, when, how, what's the trajectory from here? Yeah, so I did, uh, so this program was also, um, we did some education, obviously, because it was an, a graduate program. Um, and then after two years, pretty much, I did uh, change to another role within IBM as a consultant. Mm -hmm. So then I started to work for what is called IBM's Expert Labs. Um, so that is, um, yeah, we are, we were only working with IBM product portfolio. So we were specialists on IBM software, different types. And in my case, obviously it was the uh, data science or data mm -hmm. mining tools. Any highlights from that time? Any companies you work with or some extra fun times that you can mention? Well, that was when most of the traveling started. Oh. <laughs> so uh, I did have um, a lot of interesting projects uh, working with clients in uh, different parts of the world, mostly in Europe, but mm. also outside of Europe. Um, and I did work with companies uh, in uh, a lot of different industries. Mm. So I think, um, I don't know if there's anything in particular that I should mention, but it was, um, it was a fun time and it was interesting to see how our products were used and what value you can get out of it. Because uh, one question could be, I assume now you, you have used the product for different use cases for different industries. Uh, could you, if you reflect over that, are there some common themes in what type of use cases that was sort of prevalent at the time? What type of problems? If I take it from the, mm. it might be a different business problem, but when you look at then, then they are different, but then mathematically or what you actually were doing, can you get some, is there a red thread or something you can sort of draw mm. out here? Yes. I mean, um, two things on, uh, based on what you said now. So, uh, first of all, uh, it was easy to see that very different business problems could have the same technical solution. The data mm. problem, the data, the analytical problem underneath. Exactly. I mean, it's GPT, uh, it's GPT once again, <laughs> general <laughs> purpose technology, you know, statistics <laughs> and data mining and data science and AI in general can be yeah. general purpose, right? And exactly. what, what were they? What, okay, is any, what typically can you, can you do some yeah. generalization? I did work on, um, one project, for example, where we uh, predicted uh, traffic accidents, uh, where they were going to occur, Interesting. so yeah. that uh, uh, we so that uh, the police force could send policemen to that area, with the hope that the presence of the police would. Oh, I thought it was with the hope prevent. that an accident will occur. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 to make, prevent, pre to prevent. Prevention, prevention. Exactly. Yes. So have a police car here to calm the traffic right here. Exactly. Uh, but then uh, and the other part of your question was a little bit like which kind of business cases were uh, mostly occurring. And I would say that we saw a lot of... Um, predictive maintenance mm -hmm. examples. So I worked on different predictive maintenance cases uh, for ve vehicles, for example, understanding which parts of a vehicle that were uh, likely to break before they broke mm -hmm. so that they could be replaced without uh, spending a lot of time in the uh, workshops. Mm -hmm. For commercial vehicles like trucks and buses or also more, more for the commercial use than um, private consumer cars or both? Well, both occurred, but in my case, I worked more on, <laughs> on uh, trucks and buses. Yeah. Um, also we saw like, um, um, industries where they wanted to, uh, be able to understand when components of, um, of their production line, uh, before the components broke, they wanted to understand that they were going to break so that they can once again replace them uh, without uh, having to stop the whole production line, yeah. which would uh, mean yeah. like huge costs. So plant maintenance over plant. 
over unplanned maintenance. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> and you worked for a consultant uh, there for, for a number of years then, or how long did you continue doing that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, three and a half years, mm. maybe. <clears throat> and, and maybe now, uh, m- uh, this is the time to help us understand a little bit how IBM is organized. So you, because you have been in a sales organization around products and now you're in the consulting. Could you just give us a little bit a view of yes. Great Blue? Yes. Um, so IBM does both have a consultant organization um, and IBM is selling both software, hardware. Uh, we are also offering financial services. Mm. Um, that is if uh, someone of our customers or s- like some other uh, IT companies, customers would need to get a loan um, to be able to buy uh, yeah, products. Hey, so finance is, instead of capex investments over time, yeah. financing it. Exactly. Mm. Um, and I guess that that is pretty much the different parts of IBM that there is. The major sort of structural part is finance, products, products is software and hardware, and then we have the consulting arm. Exactly. And within the consulting arm, I, I, there is a couple of different areas like the, the labs versus the professional services or business services, or how, how does that work? Well, actually, when I was working as a consultant, this is when it starts getting tricky because the t- type of consultant that I was, was belonging to the software ah. sales organization. Mm. So I never did belong to the pure consulting um branch. Uh, so I couldn't really tell you exactly which parts there are. <laughs> and IBM is such a huge company. Uh, it's such and a huge company. How yeah. many, is it like 300,000 people or something? Or do you know the number these days? Oh, it's constantly changing. <sighs> yeah. But I know that when I, when I started, it was about um, uh, 400,000. Mm-hmm. So like a smaller country. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps we can get, uh, yeah, so that's some number, 270 is the yeah. number on Google. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and that is also because uh, when I started, we had another part uh, to IBM, which is now known as Kindrill. So um, that was a spin off that um, left IBM last year. Mm, interesting. And, uh, you know, one of the, or a couple of the, the very famous uh, moments in the IBM's history is the Deep Blue in 97 and Jeopardy in 2011. This is before your time, of course, but uh, do, do you remember or did they speak about those men- moments in any point in time or do you have any reflections on those? Uh, I mean, I speak about them sometimes, mm, okay. uh, yeah. obviously, because I think uh, it's... Um, we we sh- sh- as IBMers we should be proud of IBM's yeah. uh, history yeah. and everything that we've accomplished mm, sure. <laughs> throughout the long history. So um, okay, perhaps we should explain it. I mean, I think it's in, in AI history. These are two of the major like pivotal points that we have uh, with the, you know Deep Blue and, and Jeopardy. But how, how would you describe them? You know, what was Deep Blue's moment versus Kasparov and things like that? Well, I would rather focus on the later one, okay. uh, Jeopardy, or Jeopardy. Mm-hmm. and actually we have later ones as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah. if we focus on Jeopardy, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, some of the technology that was used when Watson was used to win uh, Jeopardy, mm-hmm. or it compete in Jeopardy and do uh, and win. And, and, win. <laughs> and win, that's the point. <laughs> exactly. Um, some of that functionality is actually... Um, functionality that is being built into the solutions that we are using and nice. selling today. Nice. Um, and what was happening was that uh, Watson was competing against uh, humans and not any humans, but actually the best Jeopardy players of all time yeah. to, um, um, yeah. And n- since the players are not allowed to use the internet, neither was Watson. So Watson had to be pre-trained and then Watson had to uh, get to hear the question at the same time as the uh, humans. The speech to text as well. Exactly. Try to understand that. Exactly. Yeah. And then uh, try to understand the given question, which was... Or yeah. answer, right? Or answer even. Right. Yeah, exactly. To uh, um, 
understand the text that was uh, given and, and understand what is it that. Um, what was the question? Yeah. So, so there are several components in this feat. Yeah, and, and uh, okay, I, I read a lot about this as well. It's, it's kind of a cool how they just managed to do that. Do, do you know anything about the underlying hardware and the solution they actually did to, to, to be able to beat the grand champion on, on Jeopardy? They had some big mainframes and things like that, right? Yeah, exactly. But I, I, I'm not really sure about the hardware mm. since that is not my yeah. okay. <laughs> area of expertise. But it was... Um, if I can add something more, like mm -hmm. the, the next part, mm -hmm. when Watson has understood like what might be the answer, answer um, then uh, and then searching for the question, <laughs> then the next part is obviously to understand whether um, Watson was sure enough mm. to answer. Right. Because you don't want a a computer or a person competing to always respond uh, since that will um, you drag lose your, points yeah. you lose points if you answer every time but you answer wrong exactly so, so you the need probability of you being wrong is also part of this equation exactly so that is the last part of the equation yeah i mean it's such an interesting thing and i you know given all the chatbots that we've had since that time you wish the chatbots were was anywhere near the performance of, of what's on at that time, right? <laughs> but okay, but and that it's fun that you say that because uh, our solutions for um, interactive assistants, as mm. we want to call them, yes. uh, is actually including uh, some of the features that we were using mm. uh, in what's on. Yeah, now they are. Now they are. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I let me refresh my memory. When, when is the Jeopardy challenge? When is 11, this? right? Is yeah, it 2011? 11. And the newer one. Yeah, um, which one was that? Yeah. That was actually when um, uh, the project debater. Right, right. So uh, now I don't remember the, which year, but I think it was maybe 2019 um, that we uh, did, like after Jeopardy, IBM was thinking, so what to do next? Mm -hmm. And the next thing was to create a system that could debate mm. a human being, mm. which is even more difficult Super than cool to just thing. find yeah. uh, the answer or the question to a question. Yeah. I think it was 19, yeah. It's kind of interesting. And Goran here is looking up the debater. So how would you describe, how, how does a debate work? Was it competitive, like debating, or what was the... Purpose. Exactly. So once again, um, the debater was created to be able to, um, um, uh, like different parts actually, it was uh, in one stage, it was used to um, help human beings mm -hmm. to get um, ideas of how to proceed oh, the debate. It's like a, this, a supporting system for humans. Though. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. And then another like... Um, version um, and the final version was actually debating uh, one of the, the world's debater, yeah. best yes. <laughs> debaters. <laughs> exactly. And in this case, um, I'm happy to say that uh, the audience, which was the judge of who mm. was debating the best, uh, did decide that uh, I think they did the three debates and two of those were won by the uh, human being, which I have to say is uh, kind of a relief, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so the dimension of debating, you know, if you, if you unpack that problem. Yeah, I mean, there's so much more than having the factual answers, yeah. right? You have to have the psychology in mind to actually do win the, the debate. argument and sort of, you know, how to build an argument. What's the logical chain of an argument? And to understand the ne nu nuances, nuances. Of, yeah. of the language. I think that is a, a big... Um, because if you're debating, you even also need to... You have a strategy of what you're going to talk about. But in the debate, ultimately to win, you need to also maneuver and mm -hmm. respond in relation to the other's rebuttal. Yes. Which is... So you need to s na navigate. And also to handle irony, for example but right. oh. maybe to understand irony, but... To win a debate, you need to be uh, 
to the right punchlines. Exactly. <laughs> I think this is coming close to, you have this kind of Turing complete kind of things where you can do basically anything compute wise, but it's another co <coughs> concept called AI complete, <coughs> which basically is saying that you need the you know human level intelligence to be able to do something. And I think debating is very close to being uh, AI complete in that way. Because you need all the, you know, the, the background knowledge, and you have to have the reasoning in mind, and you have to have like a deep understanding so, of. Yeah. So what's if, happening. if if you if you think about AI definition as human like intelligence, if if you're a, a fan of that definition, I don't, I know you don't, you are not. Yeah, but I think but that human, one of the definitions. One of the definition is human like intelligence, uh, and no, then not, I think not debate, human like, but uh, human level intelligence. Human level. Okay. I don't like, like the human like. That's another thing. But <laughs> That's it, right. It's on the level of humans, which is very different from AI. AGI, which can be, you know, far surpassing the humans. But from this perspective now, debating is even human level. Yeah. I, actually, I would argue human-like. Mm. I think in AGI system <laughs> that is like hundred times better than any human uh, would easily win a debate. As yeah, well. yeah, but that's so, so it's not human-like anymore. No, no, an AGI is not human-like, but the intelligence of this AI mm. needs to be human-like. No, I think it needs to be human level or above. Okay. Right, but we can because have this. It can if, if it's you know far surpassing human level, it's still going to win the debate. Yeah. Therefore, it doesn't have to be human like. And it has to be human level. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Ah, this is we, we, this is so interesting. Uh, you know, do, do you have a definition for AI? If we jump a little bit here, but I think it's it's a good uh, segue right here, right? Um, but we need to move into ethics as well. You know how you got started with that. I think so. We, we can add that to the list then. You know. You want to do this in this order, okay? Good. <laughs> if that's okay, it's okay with me. Sure, and, and I actually, have, that yeah. is pretty much where we are in the history right now, yes. because that was part of um, like my interest for this started during one of my projects um, as a consultant, mm -hmm. where. We were asked to um, to add some data um, to the model, which uh, many in the IBM team felt like, yeah, maybe we shouldn't do this. Like maybe we sh you shouldn't uh, do everything that you can. So in this case, it was to add ethnicity uh, to predict some sort of... Um, minor criminal offenses. So some kind of product that wanted to predict something and the added ethnicity as one of the features? No, it, it actually it wasn't added, but it was considered, uh, yeah. it was considered uh, by the client. Mm. Um, and the IBM team was a bit hesitant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in the end, uh, it wasn't added mm. um, like of, of several, several reasons. Uh, mm. But that was kind of where I... Um, started to get this interest um, for this area. Cool. And, and what year was this approximately? A uh, good question. Maybe 2018, mm -hmm. 17, something. And, and what do you do when you get a deeper interest in an area? How, you know, wh how do you start digging into it? How did you do it? Well, I was lucky since I was working at IBM and oh, IBM has a lot she. of research. Uh, so I could just um, read up on what IBM research had uh, done within the area, which was actually, um, even though it was quite early for this um, kind of uh, uh, area, <laughs> it, IBM research had already done a lot of work within that. So I started... Um, it, like this problem that I just mentioned was a problem of fairness, right? Mm. Because it was like, should we really consider ethnicity? So that was the first, um, the first angle of uh, AI ethics that I got interested in, fairness. Fairness. And how do you do that on IBM then? You worked as a consultant as well. How did you get like closer into the speciality of it? ethics in AI. Did you change roles somehow? Did you say that this is actually something I'm very interested in or how, how did that come about? Yes, at IBM we get a lot of um, uh, time to uh, educate ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I did uh, decide that this was an area that I wanted to become uh, better at and get more knowledge at. So I did um, study a lot 
um, like I said, reading up um, white papers and stuff like that. From IBM as well. From IBM as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, communicating that this was an area that I was interested in, uh, which was also, uh, yeah, how I kind of <laughs> com could um, continue uh, with the working with this at uh, IBM. And that was also when I s swapped to the role that I'm currently having. Which is, how do you is, define it? What's the current role? Uh, it is still working within uh, IBM's uh, software sales organization as a technical specialist. And um, here I am working a lot with IBM's data science portfolio as well as our solutions within uh, ethical AI or trustworthy AI. So we have, for example, one solution that we do offer clients um, mm. as part of our uh, data platform, which is called uh, Watson OpenScale. And oh. with this kind of solution, we are able to uh, provide um, functionality that mm. helps explain um, complex models, for example, right. because that is something, I don't know if we um, should talk about that dimension as well, but uh, something that is very important to be able to trust a right. model is obviously that you understand the way that it's working. So if we break that apart a bit, before we move into this, because I think this yeah. is one of the core topics of course <laughs> that we will talk a lot about, but the Watson term here, it's, it's called Watson Open Scale, and they used ops, uh, Watson for so many different products. Um, <laughs> What's the thinking there? I mean, of course, they want to use it, of course, from the Jeopardy times, etc. But is there something to what Watson means and, and why they use it for some of the products or not? Or is it just a branding thing or when and why do they use the term Watson? Oh, I don't think that I, I'm able to <laughs> answer that question, actually, oh. because I'm, I'm in the wrong part of IBM oh, okay. to know uh, <laughs> what is the reasoning by, behind the yeah. name changes. Yeah. Okay, but what's an open scale? That's one. Is that the same as the Fairness 360 or is it two different things? No, that's two different things. Okay. I mean, should we start with the open scale then and, and try to describe what that is? And uh, explaining models is one thing, but what's, what? how does it work? Is it a library? Is it a service? Is it uh, more of a like a consultancy that you can have or what yeah. is open scale? Good question. So that is actually a monitoring system within mm. our data, uh, data platform. Um, so this means that when you have a model that mm. you use to do some kind of prediction, for mm. example, we were talking about, um, what were we talking about before? Well, let's say healthcare, mm. if you have, um, a healthcare case, or let's say even better that you have um, you, a financing case or... Defaulting loans. Yeah, Should you be given a loan or something, right? Exactly. Whatever. Something like that, yes. And then, uh, obviously, you want to be able to trust this model that mm -hmm. is going to provide you information about which of your bank customers that should be uh, granted a loan or mm -hmm. not. Um, and one of the problems that we've seen uh, in the past is that when uh, models are being too complex, then it is um, a risk that uh, the model is biased. Mm -hmm. So if I could uh, refer to an example here, mm -hmm. I don't know yes. if you guys remember a few years back when uh, Apple Cards uh, unfortunately got some bad publicity in the media due to a model that was um, uh, being used to decide who would, uh, how large um, the credit limit on your Apple mm. card would be. Right. Did you? No, I didn't. I know this one, I, I don't know. But it's about detail. the credit cards basically and what the credit limits should be for those credit cards. Right? Exactly. And the problem in this case was that um, a married couple uh, applied for a card, uh, Apple card at the same time. Mm -hmm. And they, dis 
they discovered that they did not get the same credit li- mm. limit, even though they were married and they had the shared economy and they lived in the same place and they had the same age and they were very, uh, very dif- um, similar in similar many ways. Similar background as well, like similar ed- education and everything or um, jobs or... And probably not everything was exactly similar, uh, but uh, the things that they thought mattered to, I mean, what matters the most for a credit limit is probably your economical yeah. uh, stability, right? And they shared that. So they contacted Apple Cards to understand why they got so different, because it was actually not just a, a small, a small big, difference, a but difference. Uh, the wife, got uh, 20 times lower credit limit. 20 times, 20 not 20%, times. but 20 times. 20 times. Um, and the problem here was that Apple Cards didn't really, it wasn't their uh, model. So they had, this was a service oh. that they had um, uh, bought. Yeah. So they didn't really, they couldn't really respond to why why they got different credit limits. And this is where the media storm Start. started. <laughs> because then obviously what people think is, okay, so the gender is probably mm. a problem here. Mm. Also because we know that from a statistical point of view, it would make sense probably. That not 20 times, right? Not, <laughs> maybe they, not Even that. the opposite, that the, the female has a better credit. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me, by the way. Oh, okay. So you mean that uh, women would uh, get a better crim- credit limit? Why? No, I, I was joking. <laughs> and my argument in, in my family, the woman is better with money. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Maybe it's opposite in other. Could of course be, but <laughs> disturbing if the gender, of course, is yeah. the true causal factor uh, for it, uh, right? But what we do know... I was joking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course. <laughs> but what we do know is that women still, uh, in it, like statistically, earn less than men. Mm-hmm. So from that point of view, it would make sense that a model that is built upon statistics would give this kind of result. But if you have the date on the income, that should override a statistic like that, you would argue. Yeah. If they now have similar incomes, right? Yes, that's what you could argue. Uh, but yeah, the- I just have to throw in a small, you know, counterpoint here because mm-hmm. I've been also been working with these kind of models with and without genders. And I mean, a model wouldn't use a gender feature if you just think from like a decision tree, it's kind of old traditional machine learning kind of thing. They have, you know, the information gain that really decides which, you know, feature should be in the top of the tree. Um, the feature should be something that is actually discriminative which is a positive thing because it can be used to beci- decide, you know, should you get uh, a credit or a loan or not. Yeah, mathematically discriminative. So, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it should be an information gain, you know, yeah. with it. And, and if the gender has no impact on it, it's not sufficient. Even if 90% of, you know, data set of people that get loans, for example, are male, if that is not caused by the gender, uh, it actually will not be a deciding factor. It has to be a strong correlation between the gender and the actual predictive de- dependent variable. So I just want to throw in a small thing. So, so many people mistake this and think just because you have statistical difference like 60, 40, 90, 10, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a predictive uh, feature. It this can thing. be, and that's really bad. But not just because, you know, 90% of men get something or 90% of women uh, get something else uh, is necessarily the cause of it. And, and machine learning models are more sophisticated than this to decide what features is the most important one. Okay, uh, I just want to add that. Yes. But in some okay. cases, the gender is. And that is when you have true bias, you know, in a data set. And that is really bad, of course. Exactly. But uh, yeah, I think that is a good point. Mm. So in this case, uh, that was the, I mean, the problem was that the model was complex. So mm. it might be more sophisticated than that. But um, the real problem was that we don't know mm. because it was, yes. uh, a, 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 I don't know exactly which algorithm that was used, but it was probably some kind of neural net yeah. or another um, black box model, mm-hmm. which 
didn't Rim, give human any gradient time. boosting tree can be really hard to understand sometimes. So yeah, yeah but, exactly. but so, so the real problem becomes the problem of explainability. Exactly. So that's where we're coming back to open scale. Mm. So this is what one of the things that we're trying to help with in open scale when you when you're using these kind of models because the reason why you're using these kind of complex models is just what you explained mm. that you want a model that is more clever than just uh, yeah, yeah the using so yeah. so so ultimately what we're talking about here is that sometimes the best performing model uh, might not be the most suitable model for the problem because the problem requires trust and explainability. And then you can take some of the performance down, make a much simpler model that you then can have much higher explainability. I mean, is it the important thing that it has actually can be explained? Uh, sometimes take uh, some concern with that complexity by itself necessarily is no, a no. bad thing. If, as long as you have explainability, being a super complicated neural network or not, I mean, it, it's the fact that you need to have explainability, which you can have, I would argue, uh, for even large but I, but network. I, I fully agree with you, but I, you know, to push you back a little bit here, I think now we are all even talking about the cutting edge of how we need reasoning about AI systems. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if I look at this sort of trajectory here the last couple of years, oh, we can do these cool models and we realize we can do cool models. And then basically the society catches up and say, oh, this is interesting. How does it work? Mm -hmm. oh. And then and then sort of so, so the okay. research has moved more and more and more into this topic and we realize this how we can do it. OK, but let me clarify. And, and this is your topic, but uh, this is very interesting. And I think yeah, it's important it. to get this right, because yeah. it's it's very dangerous if you say, if I don't fully understand a model, and every neuron in a neural network, how that works, we can't trust it. I think that's a wrong statement to say. It's like saying, if I have a person, Henrik, that uh, I'll allow to make a decision if I should um, take a loan or not, and you say yes or no, I will not you know, trust you just because I understand every neural in your head. You have to explain it to me. You have to give some reason why you think I should take a loan or not. And that is how you build trust. And I think that should be the same for you know an AI model that you do have. So... Uh, as long as it does provide an explanation, not by understanding every small part, because you can't in a complicated model, but as, as soon as it does provide some useful explanation, then it's a good thing. So let, let's now really use this as a starting point for how do you see that? Or uh, do you, uh, you know, so it's not our rant, but it's a position statement. Yes. And what, to, how do you, how do you understand? Do you see it the same way? Do you see it in a different way or? Uh, I would agree in that um, there are different usages. So not all of them require explainability. Mm. I mean, we really need in this case, when we're talking about who will be granted a loan or not, we do need explainability because yeah. we and need. And I think in a lot of cases you need. The only thing is, exactly. it, it's not, you shouldn't you know, but, uh, equate that but, with but, complexity. But, but, but let's be really sharp here. What do we mean with explainability? Because mm -hmm. I have heard on this argument a couple of times. So the, the real argument here in, in my layman's terms is that I, I'm, I'm not expecting the a doctor who gives a recipe to explain the neural path that he took mm -hmm. in order to come up with this decision. However, I, I expect him to be able to tell me which were the discriminant factors in my thinking that put this and I can explain that to you. So if, if then the research is now going for the point that, well, you know what, I'm not going to open up the black box and understand the neural path it took, but I will actually ask the algorithm why did you take, you know, I want, I will ask the algorithm to highlight which discriminant factors that he made the choice on. Yeah. And is that an explainability? I think in your argument yeah. it is. Yes. Was that fair? Yeah. yeah. Very good. I like, I like it. I learned. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. do you see what I mean? Like what is truly explainability from AI? Is it, you know, to understand the, the lineage of the neuron or is it that they, we can actually ask the AI to say what they used? Yeah, it's more of uh, what you described there, that we do understand which factors or which variables that have been yeah. uh, important in uh, getting the result or the prediction that we 
that we got. Yeah. So that is what we would say as explainability. And that, um, I mean, if we should say or uh, talk about what in which cases we do not need explainability, it could be if I, for example, are on one of these maintenance cases and I want to understand um, how likely it is that a component will break or not. And it doesn't matter to me why, like why the system says that this will break. What is important to me is that will it break or not? Because mm. if it will break, then we will go there and we will replace the part before. So in some cases, well, you might need explainability there as well because <laughs> the person who will uh, change the part or the component might say, I don't trust this if I don't know why. But but I, I really think this is also a maturity curve because I think explainability will be part of the game because I can see even the value to understand why something breaks in order to you know use it for the design. Of and that also product. trustworthy, I think. And I, I do agree with it. Some types of systems certainly needs explainability to a higher degree than others. And especially when it comes to high risk systems yeah. like health, of course. Mm -hmm. But I remember still, you know, in a super low risk, like recommender systems or Spotify recommending a song, you know, what harm can that cause? But I would argue, you know, it's super high requirements on explainability, <laughs> explainability there as well. If someone gets a recommended, you know, really Danish rap song, Why do you give me Danish rap? <laughs> they are super angry with that. And they also, in a low risk setting, need explainability sometimes. So I think it's more useful than people think. To have but, but let me ask uh, both of you now. Uh, it, it's a loaded question. Uh, do we think the way the general discussion in politics and in these areas, are they sharp enough in understanding the, the distinction on explainability or, you know, or are we talking too much about, oh, this is a black box. I, I need to understand the lineage of the neurons or have we truly, have we yet moved to a, a little bit more sophisticated conversation? Like I think we are having right now. What do you think? Um, yeah. The only th answer I can give to that is like, if we look at the, uh, European Commission and the guidelines that they um, released a few years back. The ethical guidelines. Yes. Exactly, the um, ethical guidelines. The way that that was done was by including a high-level expert group. Mm -hmm. So they did have uh, people from different, uh, with different backgrounds, uh, which did uh, <laughs> have these discussions. Um, so it wasn't just a, a, a group of politicians maybe that didn't really understand the subject, but you really had high level skilled ex experts. Including uh, a Swede called Fredrik Heinz that yeah, was uh, a professor in Linköping University that is very knowledgeable in this as well. So yeah, it's certainly- um, and, and what is your take? I mean, like, and if we move then from, from this to more like general understanding in corporates or whatever. I think still there are too many people that do equate explainability with introspection, meaning yeah. that they need to understand the model. Otherwise you can't trust it. And I think that's a very, very dangerous path to take. Unfortunately, a lot of people still are on that path and uh, I hope we can educate and, and, and people to. But if, if it now used to have empathy, why do we, why is it easy to fall into that trap? You think? I think it's the, the need for control. You know, if you don't understand how something works and you can't understand how deep learning models work. Oh, and, oh, and, and, and so let, let me put my thesis on this. Yeah. I, I think we're coming from a, an, a, another coding paradigm mm -hmm. where we're used to the man, the man instructing and writing each, you know, the business rules of each code. Mm. So now we, now we are applying that paradigm on something that doesn't work like that. We can't debug a model as you can code. No. So therefore it's much harder to find the reason, the fault, why someone was not given a loan for it. So, so it's a little bit like you- But you, you can, I still, I would say you can do that. It's just, you, know, you need to hide, have the right techniques. So a lot of stuff here, like integrated rage and the shepherd's values and, and whatnot, that you can use. Yeah, but so isn't that the bottom line? You're trying to apply an old dogma and old thinking on a new problem and it doesn't really work. But if you, the, the, the problem statement might be correct, but how you need to address it, yeah. you need to then. Old methods doesn't work. You need to use new methods to have explainability. That's the, what right. I was trying to say. Do you agree? 
This is we talking now. Sorry for yeah. that. Yeah, but <laughs> I'm trying to follow here actually, and I'm not really sure that I did. I mean, let's let's try to to unwrap that a bit more. I think it's an important topic. So, the old style of building systems that potentially is intelligent can be rule based systems, and you build in like. In very simple terms, uh, a lot of rules. If this, then that. If that, then that. If some decision is being made, you can actually track the code and follow the rules and say this is exactly the reason that this system made this decision. You can just, you know, track, really cool. you know, backwards in the code to find that place. That you can't do in the same way anymore. But you can still do it, but that type of, you know, backtracking through the code doesn't work with machine learning. So therefore you need to have other techniques. And this is what we mean. It's you need to use new methods to have explainability of a system. And you can't use old methods like, you know, debugging code anymore because the code is replaced by a model in some part. But then you have other techniques like so, integrated gradients. So this, the, the bottom line statement, when you, the problem remains and we want to have the same outcome, but with new techniques, comes new methods yes. Yes, exactly. in, in a way. And you can still have explainability and you can still have trust, but you can't use old techniques. That's basically it. That's it. Does it make sense or? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Okay, so OpenScale, it does provide some methods and to help people to do explainability for models, right? Yeah, excellent. exactly. And mm. also to, um, help um, monitor the model's um, performance to understand like when the model needs to be retrained because we all know that since the, so the model yeah. yeah exactly <sighs> model drift mm. so what is model drift when the model is um, trained upon data uh, it does um, learn the patterns of the data right so if we're talking about the loan takers it's looking at which attributes seem to be important to uh, explain if a person will be able to pay back the loan or not. But if you don't retrain your model and you use the data from the 80s, then probably it won't work very well in 2022. And probably you even have new types of data in your data set. So the model will not be able to, um, to understand because in that time, if you had one of these um, I don't know, uh, like um, large cell phones, you know, the portable <laughs> yeah, ones. The uh, maybe if you had that one, then you were likely to repay your loan. I'm just making things yeah, up. Yeah. But uh, today, think, having a cell phone is not the discriminant determinant. Exactly. So uh, <laughs> everybody my, has a phone. My point here is that since the world is changing, the model also needs to change. The model needs to be retrained. Uh, and you can see that from its performance, because at some point it will be very um, lousy at uh, predicting uh, predicting no. what it's supposed to be. And we have so many examples of even high stakes uh, models from Google that was put on the market and they were hit the first couple of months and then they, they used to deteriorate and they actually proved completely wrong. So this is a real problem, I guess. It happens. Yeah, so then uh, the model drift is when the model starts um, uh, decreasing in accuracy. Mm -hmm. And that is when you need to go in and you need to retrain your model. Mm -hmm. And with OpenScale, you can get this information about... Uh, you can understand and monitor the performance and you can start detecting the drift proactively. Exactly. So nice. that you know when it's time to retrain your model. Cool. Should we jump into another? Um, yeah, because this was what's on open scale, right? Open scale. Mm -hmm. yes. And then the other, what, what's the other name? Yeah, what is it? Uh, Fair, Fairness 360? Or Fairness 360. Toolkit, something? Well, IBM has several toolkits. Um, one of them is AI Fairness 360. Yeah. Another one is AI Explainability 360. Uh -huh. And a third one is AI Adversarial Robustness 360. Ooh. Ooh. Nice. Let's can, unpack those. Yeah. <laughs> that, that really them, like, if you just compare them to each other, uh, what are they trying to help with? Well, just to explain like what we mean by toolkit. In this yeah. case, like OpenScale is, as I said, a monitoring system that we include in our data platform. Right. So that's something that we sell as a software solution. Mm -hmm. While the toolkits 
uh, are something that we have put together and that we have um, um, given to open source. Open source. This is op- this is toolkits open sourced for everyone to use. Exactly. Fantastic. Um, and there, I, what IBM has done is that uh, the, our research lab has thought, uh, in the fairness case, they thought, okay, so what do we need to collect? What kind of models, for example, do you, uh, uh, or algorithms, what kind of algorithms uh, do we have uh, in like the world that could be used to um, detect bias, data bias, for example? So they didn't, they didn't scraping or scanning or finding models that helped you would detect bias. Detect. And that's one of the parts. So, mm-hmm. and then they thought, so how can we, what more do we need to do? Well, we need to mitigate bias in data sets. So then they found uh, out, found algorithms for um, um, mitigating uh, bias in data sets. And then they thought, okay, so how do we ensure that a data set is actually um, um, uh, fair? And then you need to think about different metrics that are important to, to understand fairness, because I mean, what is the definition yeah. of fair? Let's start there. <laughs> yeah. So then uh, they also um, collected um, definitions, definitions and, and uh, also included then explanations to these um, uh, metrics. So this is kind of, this is what, what is. So is the idea for the toolkit to be used for other programmers and developers so they can infuse these algorithms or they can run these algorithms to, to, to get an out, uh, you know, to get a, a quality assurance perspective on what they're doing or what's, what's the idea here? Yeah. So th- the thought about the toolkits is that anyone who's working with creating, in this case, Python uh, models uh, of different kinds should be able to use these toolkits to ensure that the you know work on those fundamental problems. Exactly. So it was, it's more or less just a, a summary of things like, okay, what do you need to think about when it comes to uh, but it's a great starting point, right? I mean, like you have one toolkit that you can get a head start on the fairness problem. And then you have another one for your explainability problem. Yeah. And basically it's open source because this is so important stuff. So if you build tools, it, it's use, it, it is useful stuff in order for you to not, you know, reinvent the wheel or search yourself for every, you know. And what was the three different uh, fairness toolkits you had? If you just repeat the names of them. Uh, well, one was uh, AI Fairness 360 yeah. and one was AI Explainability 360 oh. and one was Adversarial Robustness 360. Right. Can you just go through them a bit short, quickly? It was fairness basically what you start, started to speak about. Yeah. And yeah, so to to answer that question, I would like to say so from IBM's point of view, when we... Um, when we are working with the uh, uh, trustworthy AI and AI ethics, um, we're kind of working uh, with that um, from the point of view of five different dimensions. Or yeah. um, And what we usually talk about is when, like, how, okay, let's start with how is IBM working with uh AI ethics. Mm. So first of all, we want to ensure that our own products, which include AI, we want to ensure that those are ethical or Mm. trustworthy. Mm. And then we want to help others to ensure that models that they are building Mm. are ethical or trustworthy. And then how can we do this? Well, What do we mean by trustworthy or ethical? In the technology, from the technology point of view, then IBM says that, well, it needs to be fair. It needs to be explainable. It needs to be transparent. It needs to be robust. And um, it needs to um, honor 
uh, privacy or privacy. Mm. So the, the five dimensions uh, is, is ingrained in this whole mission and, and, and the thinking to really put the context, you know, it's easy to throw around ethics, AI ethics, but here we have five core dimensions, uh, you know, that are very, uh, I think is quite. Uh, yeah, but perhaps we should go through them fair. I mean, if we just try to find a concrete example, I guess fair can be you know, age or gender or how, how this you is the bias what fair code. is, what, what does fair mean? Yeah, and this is a, a like a large question per se, because mm. as I said, you can, it, you can define fair in several different ways, but okay. So let's um, try to not go into deep into this, but um, normally what we consider fair mm -hmm. is, or, and when I say we, I mean like society. the Swedish society, mm -hmm. um, something is fair when we are not making uh, discriminations against age, gender, ethnicity, and so on. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, the, the problem that can arise, that like we said before, like my example with, uh, with the Apple Cards case, there we had uh, potentially an unfair situation right. where it was uh, a bias against against a female gender. Yeah. Well, we don't know, exactly. but it That's could have it, it could be potentially the case. It was but it's interesting because uh, from a, from a personal point of view, it, it sounds unfair. So f fairness here can then be deeper than you know. We have the main ones we understand easily, right? The politically correct ones. If I, if I argue like that. But I also would like to, to say, I mean, it, we have some objective. If it's to give a loan, it should be related to somehow the economic stability in some case, and not to these kind of subjective you know, features. But sometimes, if it is about economic factors, you know, if you were to have income, you can potentially argue that income should not be used as a fairness measure because it can be discriminatory. But in some cases, the income is actually a useful metric. So can age, so can, can gender, so can potentially ethnicity. I don't see when, but potentially. Mm. So it has to be a bit, you have to be a bit careful about, you know, what is really the objective? And yes. does a certain feature relate or should they not relate, right? Exactly. So, and this is the core point of the problem that you can't really solve. There's not one technical yeah. solution no. to the fairness problem. But there's not a one fairness definition because no. as you used till now, it depends it, on the problem. The, right? the, the fairness needs to be seen in the light of the problem yeah. context. And I actually wrote for IBM has a blog. So uh, in Sweden, it's called the IBM Think blog. IBM Think blog. And yeah. I did write. Uh, a blog post on mm. the whole topic of how to define fairness. I'll find that so that is <laughs> that is kind of uh, like how how deep you can yeah, go. If, and I was really, just, this is the rabbit hole. This is one yeah. of the rabbit holes. And there, I was just scraping on the surface. So but you were exemplifying how how intricate this topic really is. Exactly uh, how difficult it is to to understand. Um, what should be defined as fair. And, and I guess, as it was said, you know, it, it's not, you can't simply say these features should never be used or something. It depends, I guess, on the problem and the context in some way. Right. Yeah, cool. exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's also why you have a toolkit and not a one solution to, right. to the problem Makes because sense. you have to have people once again, uh, working with different algorithms and uh, using this to understand, like in our business case, in our um, context, what is fair and how do we ensure fairness? Mm. So would you argue what I'm getting out of what you're saying now, that in order to work with AI ethics, you need to, f you need to actually not only apply tools, uh, someone needs to start thinking and take ownership and building a point of view in the context of whatever business you're doing. So it becomes bigger than you st uh, apply these tools and you're done it. No, you really need to have someone spending, investing the brain power to sort this out. 
And that's why toolkits is maybe more appropriate because you're building someone's repertoire in order to build their point of view and then apply it in their context. Exactly. And this is also, I, I would say that this is also a larger um, problem than that, mm -hmm. uh, where you, because what you're describing, uh, I would say is the work of a data scientist mm -hmm. or a group of data scientists. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that this whole problem is uh, a larger organizational problem. Mm -hmm. And um, that is also why IBM is uh, recommending uh, or seeing that in the future, we probably need to have a new role in uh, the organization. <laughs> which Maybe is speaking about specialization here, but I think an AI ethics role could probably be a new job description exactly. in the future, right? Or, or, exactly. or, if you, we, or if I flip it, where would the AI ethics role report of work into today? Is it in risk? Is it in HR? Is it in... Or should ethics be part of every kind of role that you have? So yeah, it should be a natural component of every kind of role. Exactly. Right? So this is, I, I, I was mm. trying to understand that. How do you, do you draw the AI ethics as a matrix mm. view on everything? Do you put it under risk and compliance? Or where do you, you know, have you had those I'm sure you've got those questions. I mean, you are a specialist in ethics, <laughs> so we can see that that's one specific example of it, I mean, a job title like this. Yeah, and I think, I mean, every, everything can happen from here, but um, what, like, what I would expect is to, for this to show up on a greater level or yeah. like a higher level so that you mm -hmm. have like a, at IBM, we have a AI, um, AI ethics global leader, for example, mm. but it could even be that you get a chief ethics officer. That I would mean, be nice. The uh, CEO <laughs> with a different term uh, or exactly. different meaning, right? Chief ethics officer. Yeah. But, uh, but typically, uh, yeah, you, you can have an inflation in C-suite. Uh, we know that, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, like but, it's, but, I, I, but it's quite interesting because it has some importance who does the CEO report to? Is it to the CEO? <laughs> or is it, <laughs> no, I was joking. But, Wait, but I mean, let's go through the other, you know, five uh, you know, dimensions we had in FAIR. You know, we, we can see how hard it is to just define what that means. So if we try, try to keep it a bit short, um, you had another one called explainability. Yeah. And I so, mean, that one we've talked quite a yeah, lot about. Yeah. So that's to understand how the algorithm so why it a decision is, yeah. or a prediction was made. Yeah, I think way, that's, right? that's the summary we we yeah. were <laughs> stealing yeah. the show a little bit there. Yeah, I like but that. But then transparency, what, how, what's the difference between transparency and explainability? Yes, and that I understood that that question would come because that was a question <laughs> I asked myself the first time as well. Yeah. And from the IBM definition, uh, what we mean by transparency is more of the uh, transparency of how the model was created. Mm. So this is more the governance part. I mean, right. this is about data collection part and stuff like that. Exactly. Right? Which data was this trained on? Like, are there any known limitations with the model? Mm. Um, are there uh, any cases where we know that the model is not, will not work? Or wh when do we know that it's working and what, how was it tested? So more uh, being uh, transparent with what it is used how, for and how it's yeah, how, you know, explainability is AI, but how, 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 how did we go about, how was this used? Or even in the Apple case, who actually made the model? Yeah. And, and the limitations, I guess, of the model. The limitations well, of right? yeah. Yeah. So awesome. from, uh, just one yeah. part Please. there. So from IBM's point of view, uh, we are working with something called AI fact sheets. And what that is, is more of a content declaration, you could say. Mm. on uh, on the model mm. oh, so just the declaration in Swedish <laughs> <laughs> exactly I mean that should be a law because I, I think it's very very interesting right because if the ultimate game is trust mm. because yeah. I mean like the, or even the Swedish uh, report that they did in dig right mm. we, we, we realized in in the uh, public sector that maybe most the one most important determinant factor in order for this to work is trust. Mm -hmm. And then what builds trust? 
And then here we have explainability is clearly a, a component. Fairness is clearly one. But if you think about it, transparency is a huge way to understand. If I understand what you did and you are open with how you did it and humble about how you did it, that builds trust. Yeah, it's super great. Cool. Transparency, very important as well. But I don't think it's talked about. As, I mean, like we have, no. we have, we have, we have flipped down in the fairness game, bias game, yada, yeah. yada, yada. Now explainability, yeah. but the simple, you know, declaration of content uh, in all for technique and of, of, you know, it's yeah. quite simple way to build trust, like the fact sheet. Yeah. Uh, I really uh, like it. It's very good. Really like it. And also, uh, it's important because, like, uh, like a data scientist. Yeah you can uh, easily then uh, make other people understand like what you've done and not like how this can be used um, by other people. Otherwise I like, I, I felt um, that I had a lot of responsibility uh, working as a data scientist when someone used uh, the model when I was leaving the project. Right. Yeah, yeah. And less control, and you couldn't really control it anymore. But yeah. uh, but you you actually now now let's poke the bear a little bit. Mm -hmm. If there's any industry where we should start asking for in-laws for technic mm -hmm. transparency, is the stupid AI industry th that slaps the word AI on everything from mother and his dog. <laughs> <laughs> right. So couldn't you know? So actually, we we should really eat our medicine here. So how many things has not been rebranded overnight to be an AI tool, mm -hmm. which is literally, you know, okay, tell me what's the math behind this, yeah. please. Mm -hmm. Let's start here. I think this is actually. It's very profound, I think. It, I think it's profound to talk about transparency and it is something, it's, it's a medicine this industry needs to eat, I argue. Yeah. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. Totally. Because so much bullshit going on, to yeah. be fair. <laughs> all, all of these um, terms are very broad and uh, means different things to different people. And they are being abused as well. Yeah. But, but, but Consciously. But as it, I would argue. all of a sudden the transparency, I, I'm, I'm getting excited now because I realize <laughs> how important. Yeah, yeah, Goose Gum. Look at this, I get Goose Gums. <laughs> this is for real. I get it at least a couple of times because we have so great guests. Yes. But the transparency topic is so important because it would be so much more clear clearer what is the actual math behind your approach very simple and and uh, i don't know I, I sorry for being a rant there but i just, yeah. I, I, I just got a, it's, it's I, I, I just got oh my god that that, that would solve a bit i guess yeah. in, in this industry cool so fairness explainability transparency and robustness then what does that mean yeah so robustness is more um um, I would say that's the security uh, part of the solution. So the model needs to be robust, both in the way that we talked about before, that uh, if the model uh, starts drifting, uh, you can't really trust it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not really robust. But also you need to understand that no one has tampered with uh, neither the model per se or the data. And also, I guess uh, one way uh, that I like to say it, it, it should be also safe against like uh, um, non-substantial changes in the input. So, sometimes, you know, a small change yeah. in the input, like the age plus one year or something, cause a big change in the output, and that's not being robust anymore. So it should be re robust, robust to the small changes in input as well. Yeah. You see what I mean, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Awesome. And privacy, I guess that's not, or does it even need a... a yeah, what's, a, yeah, maybe a little bit. So what's, uh, the, what's the AI point of view with uh, privacy? Are we going down into the AI Act type topics in the EU then, or what do we mean with privacy in IBM? Uh, yes. So uh, what we mean is that the data obviously needs to be safe, both where it resides, uh, but also so that the model cannot be, um, so that you cannot send in data and kind of backwards engineer the model to get the data, if you know what I'm saying. To understand who's, who's behind this recommendation. 
Okay. I mean, to extract, you know, private information from the model by reverse engineering it, basically. So, yeah. yeah. But maybe, th now, this is maybe, I, I t I'm going to test something with you. When someone is using AI to manipulate my private thoughts. Yeah. So, you know, is this part of privacy? So if, if I'm thinking carefully. Like subliminal messages well, I'm like, or what? So the whole argument that mm. basically, you know, the whole Facebook and, and the, yeah, the ma mass media, the, the bubble, right? We were filter talking about the filter bubble. So if someone is actively uh, uh, using uh, bubble filtering bubble techniques, uh, let, let's let's argue that they exist, right? And, mm. and let's argue that, that actually that I am actually conveyed over time by a constant hammering to a certain point. Is this a privacy topic that right. someone is screwing with my head? What do you think? I'm biting my tongue, but I'll let Interias answer first. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's in the same ballpark, if this is a different topic altogether. Um, yes. Well, so I would say that um, this is totally uh, something that is part of the AI ethics uh, yeah. area. So this is totally part of the trustworthy AI. Uh, would IBM uh, label this as a privacy. I'm not sure. Not sure either. I, I, there was a stupid question. It's clearly an ethical question. Privacy question. can be so much simpler, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, in what you mean. I mean, you want to safeguard your own data and, and not you have some kind of control and ownership of your personal data in some way, right? Isn't that a simpler way to describe it? Or that's the core. That's the core privacy, maybe. Yeah. Well. Um, when you when you start talking about this, this really makes me think about the fact that I'm not sure if you read, but um, China actually has decided to um, come up with a legislation or regulation. I'm not sure law, uh, um, similar to the uh, EU AI Act. Uh, and I just read it like mm. a week ago or something. Mm. Um, and a, Im, an important part here in this new leg, Chinese legislation is what you're talking about here, that you should not be um, as a user of a system. Uh, the system should not, uh, is not allowed to be addictive. Yeah, exactly. As, like because manipulation is not only about my, 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 my thoughts, but it's also the addiction manipulation that I stay in the system. As an example, exactly. And this is something that they cover in this new. Mm. I guess. I mean, we should. I think it's really good to be objective here as well, and not only blame China for social scoring and whatnot, but they actually do also work with privacy topics as well, and, and try to have some protection of their citizen and their personal data right? and not being addicted and things like this. Yeah, I think the interesting part here is that uh, EU really mm. has been in the driver's seat within mm. this area and um, really wants this area to, um, to be important also in other parts of the world. And I was... I have to admit that I was surprised when I saw that China might yeah. be the first country exactly. to get, uh, uh, I, I'm not really sure about the terminology here, but a law or mm -hmm. regulation, regulation or legislation or whatever, uh, through even before the EU yeah. uh, manages to, yeah. to. And they have some other issues with, you know. Uh, like surve sure. surveillance societies, etc. But they they do care and then do have a lot of work with ethics as well in China. And I think it's but good to be objective and, and talk about that as well. We, we have so many topics now. Should should we, should we stay with IBM or should we go into one of the rabbit holes with the EU regulation? And and, and because we are, we are sort of mm -hmm. we, are, we are we are talking about an, a subject now that maybe not all our listeners yeah. are familiar with, or maybe we should park it and do it later. What do you think, Anders? Yeah, regulations is so fun to speak. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, no, but I think it's but the, AI but the, the AI. one small thing before we move to that, yeah, perhaps. Good. I think, you know, bias as a term is also something I think that is a bit mis misunderstood. And and so many people think, and it would be fun to hear what you think about this, Therese, but bias uh, is not only a bad thing. And I 
sometimes people say the only solution to fight bias is to make sure that we have 50% of everything. Everyone should be 50% female or male. Everyone should be the, the average age of a person. Everyone should be the average ethnicity. Everyone should have an average income. And then we have a fair system. I think that's a very dangerous path to take. If we remove all the bias, the data becomes completely useless and we can't even use it to make any predictions, and why AI is that, or not. Why, um, why is that not this? I mean, if you don't find any patterns in the data to make a prediction, human or AI, the data is not useful. It is a, a good bias is necessary to make any prediction that is driven by the data. But then, then I think the, we need to understand what is a mathemal, mathematical discussion about bias or, you know, because for me, I think the word bias for me, I don't understand the word enough yeah. to follow you. Well, if I can yes, please. break in. So when I talk about, <laughs> when I talk <laughs> about, I, break in. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> when I talk Beautiful. about this, I, I tend to uh, call it unwanted bias Gosh, because exactly. just like you're saying, I mean, statistics is built upon bias. Yeah. So if yeah. we would remove all bias, mm. well, then we can just stop using statistics. <laughs> and then, I mean, AI, I would uh, argue is built upon statistics in some ways. Yes, so then AI would not work. Yeah. Nor would humans that look at the data as well. No, if exactly. the humans look at so, the data, they can't find anything. Okay, so, so now for the ignorant guy, what, what, did, what, what did, how, how would we frame bias in a more mathematical, sort of not loaded negative term? You should have an information gain. It's very simple. So <laughs> bias has to do with information gain. Could you explain? Could you guys explain? I mean, I think if we take the simplest thing, if you flip a coin and it's 50-50% chance, if it will be head or tail, uh, there is no information gain at all in knowing if uh, it will be head or tail. However, if it's a biased coin that has 70% of having head versus 30% on the tail, then there is an information gain in knowing the head or tail. So it's basically the entropy kind of measure that you have, uh, which is very similar to information gain. If there is some kind of discriminatory power behind a certain feature like the head or tail, then it's a useful thing to have to make a decision. Not necessarily bad. It's actually become very good to have discriminatory power. If you have no discriminatory power, it's a completely useless feature and would never, if you build up a decision tree with machine learning, come up as a node of decision in that tree. So bias is good. Otherwise, so so me, who, who, me who is not the mathematician who hasn't done this properly professionally like you guys. So bias is a term that highlights a, 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 the information gain or the discriminatory the, power, discriminatory power in different features. Yes. So and therefore, therefore, thing. bias is in, in in is part of the game. However, what we are talking about here. I mean, I have almost forgot one of the words. Unwanted bias. Right? So unwanted Teresa. bias that Terry yes. said. Yes. So what we are now saying, bias, 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 you know, in all, you know, media. No, no, no. <laughs> you, have, you clearly haven't done your math because everything is biased. Yes. It's unwanted bias that you want to talk about. Exactly. And I think this, for me, this is, uh, I learned something a little bit more clear on the term bias right here. Yeah. Because uh, when you when you're looking at the loan, for example, um, the loan example that we had before, well, you need uh, the data to be. Uh, I mean, if it would be any other um, any other variable or attribute than gender, if it would have been, for example, um, amount of money in your bank account that was important into uh, saying whether you got the loan or not, then you wouldn't consider that to be biased, right? Because obviously you think that it's totally fine that the bank says that if you have more money in your bank account, you're allowed to take a greater yeah. So, so here there is, there is a valuable information gain. There's a discriminatory factor uh, how much money people have in their bank account that has a strong correlation to if they're able to pay back on their loans and interests. Simple as that, right? Yeah. And it is a bias. It's just a wanted bias. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. 
Ah, cool. I, I think it's good but to this is important. talk about these kind I, I of think terms. Actually, because these terms, we are using them in media and we are talking about them even on stage. Mm. And not everybody in the, in, in the audience is a statistician. Yeah. Cool. We have like a quarter left, but, you know, we have so many interesting societal topics as well. But should we just very, very briefly go through some regulation topics as well? If you want to, if you say I... I completely bored by regulation and we just skip it <laughs> yeah, in the amount of time. Maybe yeah, it's up to you, Therese, because maybe we have more fun topics. Yeah. Well, guys, I think, uh, I don't know. Uh, what do you guys think? I think that there, it is interesting. Like we said that, uh, China has now also right. started to look at this. This um, is the scoop today, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, from uh, IBM's perspective, we do, um, we, we also had uh, an uh, IBM expert within this. Mm. Uh, exp is uh, is IBM expert. involved in the AI Act? I guess they are. But are you personally involved in that in any way? And the, uh, no, personally, no. I'm not. Mm. So the expert that we had representing IBM right. was... Because it was part of the ex expert group, I think, for the... I'm not sure if it was the... Ethical guide. It was an ethical guidelines. I think IBM had an expert there. Exactly. Right. Exactly, yes. and that was our AI ethics glo global leader oh, okay. who was part of that job. Mm. And I would say that you can easily see that um, from also we talked about before this. We talked about um, before tonight mm. uh, and this uh, recording. Mm. We talked about. Uh, Virginia. Yeah, Virginia Dignam. Yes. Exactly. And she was also a part of that. Right. And you can see how different uh, stakeholders, uh, like together, uh, the um, their views on uh, what is important uh, for AI ethics and trustworthy AI kind of form mm -hmm. the same uh, guidelines that uh, the e EU Commission's uh, ethical guidelines Mm. Are, um, or consist of. So what I'm saying is that you can see that EU has been influenced by these players mm. like IBM or Virginia, but you can also maybe see how IBM and Virginia has been influenced on mm -hmm. uh, from this collaboration uh, within the EU Commission. Should, should we just, you know, we have spoken about the regulation a number of times before. And if we just focus, I mean, I think we can all agree that the regulation is good uh, and it has great intentions and we need to have it. Yeah. The question is just, you know, how do you execute that and implement that in a way so it's actually beneficial and not, you know, too harmful for innovation or for economy or for companies that we have and for society in general. Because if you do it in a wrong way, it can actually be hurtful, I would argue, for society as well. And one thing we've said a lot about GDPR, for example, when that was implemented in 2018, was that it had great intentions. It, one of the intentions was actually to simplify regulations, if I recall correctly. <laughs> and, and I would argue that the implementation didn't uh, fulfill that. And I would argue even that it actually had the opposite effect in some way, saying that big companies like IBM or Google or Facebook, they had no problem following the regulation that they provided, you know, about the right to be forgotten or a right for right to access or whatever, all these kind of rules that you had to abide by. But the small companies did. And, and that actually became a divide between companies that have the legal power to implement these things and those that don't. Would you agree with that? Okay, so what you're saying is actually that um, from the GDPR, um, like it was different on how well you could um, uh, implement or follow well, GDPR. You, you need to follow a set of, you know, regulations uh, to yeah. be conformant with GDPR. Yeah. Like, you know, if someone comes to Spotify and say, remove all the data that is collected, connected to me, it's a super, super hard thing to do. They have tens mm -hmm. of thousands of data sets and to remove every piece of data in a small part or something that has millions of users in it, it's a super hard thing. They have a really smart way to do it and solve, and solve it that way. But not everyone has the power, uh, the technical power to have the infrastructure to be able to, to, com to abide by right to erasure, right, right to be forgotten, or right to access. Give me everything you have about me. You know, that's super hard to do. And, and if you can't comply with that, 
you can, you know, suffer 4% or 20 million euros in fines. Yeah. And then I know that some companies have chosen to not take that risk and instead stop using AI. Yeah. And, and that's really dangerous, right? Yeah. So what you're th saying is that maybe uh, the regulation is prohibiting like small actors. Yeah. Yeah. And, may, and it's causing an increase in divide between the big players and the, the normal or small players, I would argue. And, and but and here basically it it's I mean like we have had this conversation a lot, right? And <laughs> and, 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 and and I think the main conclusion so far, and let's test it with you, Therese, is that mm -hmm. Intentions are good, and and but it it it's it's sort of how to execute on it, or how how to translate something that becomes fairly operatable, um, given th that the landscape of how data savvy we are and what type of platforms we use. Uh, for some people, uh, you know, the, the tech giants, it's it's way they they. they their tech stack has already sorted this out for other purposes, so to speak. Yeah. So here's the topic, right? Um, how to, how to sort of make something have the right teeth, so to speak, but that, but in the right way, not be hurtful or sort of. Do huh. you follow? No, not really. <laughs> I, mean, so. I mean, simply, I mean, we, we want to preserve privacy. Yeah, that's an easy thing. Yeah, it's easy, easy it's thing to say. We want to simplify regulation. Right. Yeah. This is basically the core, one of the core messages of GDPR. But in reality, what turned out is that the it was not a simplification. It actually in, you know, it was a lot of insecurity and clarity. Or, or yeah, or how, to how, execute, to implement this. how to implement, how to execute. This caused instead of a divide between companies that have a very strong tech stack and infrastructure and legal resources mm. to those that don't. So in, instead, it actually promoted the tech giants, which was not the intention mm. of GDPR. And and that's not good, right? No, I mean, if that is the case, then I would uh, agree that that is not um, good because that was not the intention yeah, with exactly. the GDPR. Well, let's hope uh, that AI acts that whenever, if ever, it will be enacted uh, have some clear guidelines at least of how to actually implement this. Right? And maybe a last question here for me to follow. Um, we, we are talking about the AI ethics mm. uh, guidelines and now we have the AI Act. These are two different things, right? Or is it the same? No, yes. no, no. I mean, it's a legislation being promoted. The, the, the one is a le legislation being up for a draft and promotion and the AI ethics guidelines is guidelines. Yes. Oh, got, yeah. It's got, yeah. So there are two different documents. Yeah. And yeah. I think the AI Act is a directive and GDPR was actually a regulation, which are two different things. So regulation is mandatory and directive is something that states can implement. But yeah, it's still, it's a legislation coming up. In some okay. Cool. Should we leave? I think we'll leave it. Yeah. It's so <laughs> It's not suitable for an after work to speak about regulations. No. Cool. Should we move a bit more into philosophical uh, and societal topics? And, and I think if we start with some simple question, perhaps, uh, or not simple, but simple to phrase the question, hard to answer. <laughs> <laughs> some people are scared about AI. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think uh, an important part is something that we have discussed Mm -hmm. earlier today and that is people don't really understand how it's working right so and if you don't understand something then it you tends to be it. scary yeah. uh, and yeah. also since uh, we might have seen quite a lot of uh, publicity in the media for example Terminator. media storm <laughs> yeah and also movie, movie. Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of i think that is also an important factor why yeah. people are um, afraid. About Are you afraid about AI? <sighs> Not AI per se, mm -hmm. um, but obviously I, I can see uh, concerning um, ways that it's been used. And well, abused perhaps. Abused, yeah. yeah. Just like you were saying here before, like if we, I, I don't know about you guys, but I can be 
uh, become quite addicted to uh, Instagram. Mm. So I'm just sitting there and it's so wonderful because it's always uh, showing like pictures that I want to see, right? Mm. And uh, this kind of time waste <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, yeah, an example of how we can get trapped in a digital wor world rather than just live a metaverse even yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should go there yeah okay but in, in general if we ask a question or rephrase it like this then um, there are certainly ways to abuse AI but there are also potentially positive gains would you say you're more an optimistic side of things that you believe AI will bring more good than bad to the society um, yes I, I think otherwise I wouldn't really have this job <laughs> if I didn't uh, really uh, appreciate the uh, potential with uh, this kind of technology and this. So I would say yes, um, the gains of uh, AI or data science yes. um, are great. So we could actually do a lot of good and innovation in the world. And and um, how do you understand the potential of AI? Um, Is, what's, in, what, how, how do you think it's going to impact? I think if, if I would say like areas where I think that it can do a lot of good and where it could, um, yeah, do a lot of good, um, obviously healthcare, mm. but also I think um, IBM has a... A collaboration with uh, the Vatican called the uh, Room Call for Action. So it was, um, it's IBM, it's Microsoft and a few others that together with the Vatican has um, created this uh, document, the Room Call for Action to help. And this is also a part of the like trustworthy ethical AI um, to help uh, this kind of technology to be available also not only to the tech giants who can afford it, mm -hmm. but also to people who cannot afford it. So yes. make it a like democratize yeah, Democratization. Yeah. Democratize. Um, yeah, yeah. And then uh, w what we've seen there is, um, or what I wanted to say there is that we've seen in one of the collaborations that we've done, uh, AI has been used to uh, fight world hunger, mm. uh, especially, um, or this was implemented after COVID when uh, it's got even more diff difficult in some parts of the world um, to, uh, yeah, with farming and uh, selling your crops and stuff like that. So what we've seen from there is that AI has been used um, to help farmers to uh, make the uh, agriculture more sustainable, to um, help uh, like with the logistics, to make sure that less food goes to waste, for example, and also to help uh, preserve um, the crops uh, by protecting it from uh, pesticides, for example. But let me reframe it a little oh. bit. So we, we have had, uh, you know, 100 years of uh, uh, technical innovation, right? So technical innovation is happening and we have te different technologies. But once in a while we have, a, we have some fundamental uh, you know, uh, game changers or paradigm shifts or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, do, do we think AI is something more than just any innovation? Uh, is it, is, is it really a game changer in some ways? And, and why is it that? Ah, uh, so you're, what you're actually is asking is, is it a have? revolution? Yeah. Do, do we, we have, have an AI revolution, revolution that we are not really realizing, but it's actually in the making? Uh, I, yeah. If it's not part of the kind of internet, uh, IT revolution that I would argue that started uh, like in the 80s or 90s, um, maybe even. Yeah, so no. is, is it part of it or is it something on its own? Exactly. That is the question, because obviously I think 
it is a revolution that's so, going on right is it part of that or is it like Deeper, by yeah. itself a, a revolution well uh, too early to tell i think i i have i have a very clear point of view on that yeah me as well <laughs> <laughs> please go ahead uh, okay, I can start. I, I just like to quote, you know, Agra, Aya Agraval, you know, the, the professor in economy that now turned into an AI professor, but he wrote a book called The Prediction Machines, and he compared the AI revolution to other disruptions that happened throughout time. So for one is the transistor in the 50s that led to the computers that we all have and use today. You know, it changed the type of jobs we had at that time and created new type of jobs. We said the internet. It's been around for a time, but didn't really become really popular until the mid nineties with the web, but it also changed the job that we had in creating new type of jobs we've never seen before. And he says now, which AI, which also been around for a long time, but didn't really become as popular and powerful until the mid 2010 ish, mm -hmm. also would call cause a disruption and create, you know, change the jobs we had and, and new jobs, type of jobs we've never seen before. And he says that AI, the AI disruption will be bigger than the internet and the transistor revolution that we oh, see. Oh, really? And, and um, I, this is my take on it. Uh, when I try to explain why I think AI is something to pay attention to, that people don't really understand how far it will go. Mm. So in, 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 my, in, my, in my simple picture, I, we, for me, the industrial revolution represent a huge paradigm shift when we do automation of muscle power. So we, we realize how we can have machines automating how we build stuff, muscle power. And with, with algorithms and data and, and moving into decision making, we are now getting the opportunity to automate more knowledge intensive processes. So basically from basically being able to, um, you know, automate simple processes, you know, RPA or whatever, all of a sudden now, you have to say RPA as well. No, whatever, right? <laughs> like, stu you know, stupid, simple processes with, that we could put simple rules on, right? Um, now we get into more knowledge intensive processes or, and we get, we can get the whole of more data intensive processes. And then the sky, you know, the imagination is, is the limit, right? Because all of a sudden now we, we're into the paradigm of, of automating brain power. So ultimately, what does that mean when you, when we automate and optimize brain power, you know, th then, then to me, it means you will have data and algorithms in different ways, supporting or reinventing every single process in universe that we know in terms of what you do for work, what you do for leisure and stuff like that. Now that, that change in power, I don't think simply the, the digital I mean, like the internet and all that has a huge power, but it, it, it is not re in reframing how work is done. Data and AI is reframing how work is done in the same way as the factory was reframing how work is done for, for muscle power. So th this is to me how I'm trying to simplify automation of brain power. Yep, that will be big. <laughs> it will be big, I think. Yeah. Can easily. Okay, let me try to find some closing discussion on this and bring it back to AI ethics as well. And one of the problems there, uh, when we start to automate the brain power, as you say, is that we need to have some value alignment. Uh, and this is a term that's often used. It's, it's the value alignment between humans and machines. If we have a self-driving car that have, you know, making decisions that is not in alignment with what our values are, it can be some problems with that. And, and of course, in any kind of other automated system as well. So that I think brings it back of the importance of AI ethics. You know, how, how can we assure that we have a value alignment so we can live in harmony with machines and AI? Do you think this is a field that will a bit leading question, sorry. Is this a field that will increase in importance and that is the way to find a solution to the value alignment problem? Do you think so, Therese? Um, so it depends on when you speak about the value alignment, is it between, um, between <laughs> like the human and the system you mean, or do you mean like, uh, when we talk about the car, like mm. you, you obviously might have different values in different part of the world. Mm. So is that what you're talking about or the cultural changes or differences? 
Yes. Okay. I have to unpack it a bit more. And and there are so many good, great people that speak about this. But you're correct. Values differs between people, cultures, ages, gender, so many things. There is not a single value that rule them all, so to speak. So how do we do that? How can we make a system that is aligned then if we don't have a single value system in place? And I think, you know, once again, you can think about, okay, should we use a rule-based system to define this is the rule? You should hit the dog before you hit the human. That's a rule, hard-coded rule you can put in the self-driving car. Is that the right way to do it? You should hit a 90-year-old person before a five-year-old person. That could be a rule that we put into a system. Is that the right way to do it? Nah, probably not. The mm. value system that we need to build is a super complicated thing. How do we solve complicated problems when we can't manually encode the rules? We use data. And uh, once again, I'd like to quote you know, Jan LeCun here. He says basically, this is not a new problem. We have been designing values for thousands of years. This is why we have laws in our society. This is how we define what is right and wrong in some way. If we can do the same, so we can apply that for machines as well, we will have some kind of value alignment. But it's not by trying to encode a few simplistic rules. It's about automating that process. It's about using data to fulfill the rules that we have in the society already today. I think that's the right way. Sorry for ranting here a bit. But it wasn't think, a question anymore. It was a rant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but do you see one point? You know, it, it is super hard, as you say, and, and super hard problems is not solved by hard coding rules. You can't do that. But we, we know we can because we see the system and society that we have today, perhaps not the last couple of weeks, but still, anyway, most of the society that we have is working surprisingly well and has been improving in quality for thousands of years so we know how to use rules or laws, regulation or policies or values to improve our society. This is not a new problem. And we simply need to have systems that can learn to do the same. And I think machine learning is a very important solution to that problem. Yeah, and I think um, when in the situation that you're describing, it it becomes very important all of the factors that we talked about earlier when we talked about transparency yes, for example exactly. like the which, five dimensions that yeah, you mentioned is explainability, perfect explainability fairness yeah. because all of those become very important when you to understand like how was the system built mm -hmm. um since we might have different data mm -hmm. or different yeah thought yeah. cultural differences yeah. in different parts of the world. It needs to contextualize and needs to understand so many more things than small, simple rules. And then you need to have a system that can automatically from data learn as humans do. And you need to have thought about before, what is your fairness definition, yes. for example? Yes. What is fair to, I don't remember what you said, but to uh, hit the car, uh, hit the old woman or mm. hit the small child. child. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What is fair? <laughs> cool. But you, I think, you know, AI ethics is super important. I think like explainability and transparency, as we mentioned, is one of the core things that we need to focus so much more. And we're not doing sufficiently, but with people like you, I think we are in a good way to a better society that can be more ethical in the use of AI. Right? One, one last uh, question. Uh, what would you say is a good tip starting point for, for if you know if someone listening or uh, start going uh, oh we, we should probably look more into this where, where do you start um well it depends really where this person or where this organization is at mm -hmm. because i could say for example have a look at the toolkits that we just talked about mm -hmm. But that is if this is an organization or a company which has already today started with AI. Mm -hmm. So haven't you started with AI at all, then uh, you probably, it's good that you think about the ethics part, but you, you probably need to think about your use case first and uh, understand how, uh, which type of uh, ethical issues uh -huh. you might uh, 
yeah, need to consider? I think this is the very, very simplest, best tip. The AI ethics journey starts with your use case. And then with your use case, your product, and then, you know, what, and then basically earlier think about proactively what the ethical dimensions could be and when you go into it. Exactly. Awesome. Very good. Therese, what's next in your life? What's happening coming months to you personally, professionally, something else? Um, yes. So the next coming months, um, well, I will not be working for that long <laughs> because I am um, pregnant. So I will. Congratulations. Hopefully. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So I will hopefully uh, go on parental leave uh, this summer. Mm. And you have to apply some kind of value alignment with your kid <laughs> instead of the AI system at that time. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Awesome. Decoder. Oh, wow, that's a big what's coming up. Yes. That's a, one of the best. Awesome. Yeah, I can see that's a, that's a big thing coming up in your life that will occupy a lot of thinking. And you have to study now a bit, right, for that. Or what, what, what were you saying before? Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's so much uh, that you need to study. You're recommended to read books and listen to podcasts. Or, and or, or not. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'm always happy when parents uh, tell me that uh, actually we didn't. But because I think you can get overwhelmed by, you know, the information overload. And, yes. and I, I bet you, you can go out and find the book. If you think there's different ways to do things, you can find the book <laughs> that supports whatever, story whatever, story, yeah. whatever thing you think is right. But, Perhaps it will be a book about you know, ethical parenting or something. Uh, <laughs> or something. Who knows? <laughs> exactly. Ethical parenting Stay maybe tuned. is good for AI, right? You know, train, <laughs> the, train the AI. <laughs> Anyone that you would recommend to come on this podcast? Someone you, you'd like to listen to uh, here? Um, yeah, I would say that um, if, if we start with the area that I think mm. would be interesting, yes. I think AI within security mm. would be interesting. I'm like not cyber sure. security or what type of security? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so I'm We've not sure. We've talked if, about that quite a bit. Yeah. So that's, that's oh, you have? No, no we no, have we, said that uh -huh. AI security is, is a topic. Yeah, we, we haven't had it on a show. We haven't had a, so a real a great, security, yes. AI security person. Like people have been knowledgeable, but not someone who is sort of deep, deep, mm. deep in that field. Yeah. I wish you certainly have that, especially in these times. So yeah. yeah, great. And I'm not really sure like if, uh, who is the right person, but I did attend, um, a few days ago, I did attend a webinar, um, which was given by, uh, I think he was a professor at the, uh, Arebro University, mm -hmm. and he was called like Alberto. Uh, what was his name? Alberto Giacometti? No, Giaretta. Alberto Alberto Giaretta. Uh, please come back to with, with with us with a name. So it sounds awesome. It's a topic that we certainly should cover more. I think. Awesome, Therese, It's been a true pleasure to have you here. Um, and of course, a lot of topics that we didn't cover, but I think we covered the most important ones. <laughs> yeah, we did. I think we, I think we got to a really good conversation this time about AI ethics. And, and I really like when you start with five dimensions like that, or, you know, it, that's it's one really, of the core. Yeah. really, really good because there, then we have a framework and then we could go. So that was really helpful. Thank you for that, Therese. Thank Perfect. you very much, Therese. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, it was a pleasure. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a pleasure for me as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.